Well, good morning again. Thanks for being here. All of you joining us online, thank you just for being a part of, of this family. We love you, and, and we're glad you're here. Uh, we are, I was going to say in the middle of, we're not really in the middle of, it's a two-part miniseries, so you can't really be in the middle of that. You've heard it said, you know, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. In this case, there wasn't. There was just a beginning and an end. So welcome to the end of this two-part miniseries, um, informally known as Welcome to Shine. That's what we call things when we don't really know what to title them. So we're like, hey, here's a little bit of what God's doing around here in 2022, we think. So there it is. Uh, but I'm excited. If you didn't hear Pastor Dan's message last week, I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel and listen to that. Uh, it was all about God kind of shifting our perspective from, I think, what by default in this world, we oftentimes tend to see business or life or maybe even church as we start with the vision we clarify the tasks, and then we bring people in to do those things. And hey, sometimes relationship is kind of a byproduct. Maybe we get there, maybe we don't. And I believe that God just, just really spoke to us on the idea of, hey, in the kingdom, sometimes God wants to start with relationships. And through getting to know one another, we discover gifting. And through then identifying the giftings that God has put we can clarify the vision that he uniquely has called us to. So anyway, go listen to that if you haven't. If you want to follow along the notes today, uh, you can find them on the YouVersion app on your device. Um, my wife did want me to start off with a quick testimony, and that is yesterday we had something crazy happen in our family as I was entering the notes into YouVersion, speaking of, and that is my daughter and son-in-law uh, texted the entire family. We have a text thread. We call it the Big Tribe. They texted out, and they said, uh, our doggy ran away. And three of our four kids got puppies last year, like in the last six months. And this is a beautiful little uh, beagle, if you can pull her up. Yeah, that's Harlow. And they had gone to visit some friends in Florida. They're living in Nashville now, but they went, drove six hours to Florida. They drove an hour out into the country where this gender reveal party was going to be. And as part of the gender reveal party, because it seems appropriate when we're talking about babies, to fire like shotguns like 10 times. Some of you guys are like, yeah, I like that, you know. <laughs> anyway, that's what they did. Well, the, uh, Harlow got skittish, started crying, jumped out of her arms, ran into the woods, and was gone. They could not find her. They looked, they started panicking. We all started panicking. I mean, we were very calm and like, the Lord will surely intervene. Anyway, but we were all praying together. We were crying. We were bargaining with God, negotiating. I said, Lord, I know you've got four extra angels up there because the word says there is 10,000 times 10,000, which is like, I think, billions or something. Anyway, I'm not a mathematician, but I'm like, you can spare four. And I literally was praying, God, I want one on every side of that doggy you know, keeping her away from the alligators and the snakes and busy roads and all this. And we've lost dogs to, you know, getting hit by cars and stuff like that. We know the pain of that. And uh, it, an hour went by, hour and 15, hour and a half, hour and 45, two hours. They were literally getting ready to give up and to drive an hour back into where they're staying. And um, we were all praying. We're on a, a FaceTime together as family. And Nathaniel, my son-in-law, just told Ellie, hey, we just need to put all of our faith in God right now. Whatever's left of faith right now, we need to put in God. And literally he said that, and she looked up and said, there she is. And she had come back. This is what she looked like when she came back, if you can pull up the other photo. Do you have another photo of her? So that's Harlow, you know, in a happy state. Oh, no, you know what, there's not. I'm so sorry. Anyway, I'm gonna have to describe it. Her eyes looked like she had a story to tell. She'd been out in the wilderness <laughs> for two hours, two and a half hours. And my wife was dropping off a uh, carpet shampoo machine that we'd used uh, at Lowe's. And she pulled up right behind a truck that had a license plate that said, God saves, S-A-V-Z. And literally she felt like, you know, the Lord was speaking to her because we were starting, you know, we were struggling with like, okay, Lord, how's this going to end? And, you know, your mind starts going to, are we going to get the little paw print? I mean, you know, just the whole deal. And, uh, and we literally, I sat there at my desk and just sobbed in gratitude to the Lord. And listen, I know that not every story has a happy ending, right? We're not here to tell you that, hey, every time we ask God for something or that, you know, every time we need a healing, it happens the way we want and all that. That's not, don't, don't take that away. But I do want you to be encouraged. If you're asking the Lord for something, if you've wondered, is it too insignificant is God too busy? Does he care about your pet? Does he care about your job interview? Does he care about your relationship? Does he care about, you know, this or that or the other, the desires of your heart, things that, you know, you might be tempted to think he's too busy for that. He's not. And he is listening. I can't promise how he'll answer, when he'll answer, what it will look like. 
but I know that he does care about you and that he loves you. So receive that. That's, that was bonus. Um, but we're here to talk about today, uh, in concluding this mini-series, the idea of the importance of training. Why is training so important to God? And um, I have three reasons. The first one I'm going to kind of move pretty quickly through, and then, and then the second and the third one is where I really want to take some time to talk together. But the first one, why is training so important to God? Um, rule number, or, or answer number one, because he says it's important to him. When God's word says something matters, then I think you would probably agree with me. We can all pay attention to go, hey, that might be something to pay attention to. So Pastor Dan talked about Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 13 last weekend. I'm just going to take one more opportunity to read it with you because I believe it is that valuable to what God is speaking to us as a church. But it says this, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers, pay attention to this part, verse 12, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. I mean, first of all, how awesome is it that God is saying, hey, this is where I want you to go, to the full measure of Christ. He speaks to us there of unity, in the faith. He speaks to us of knowledge of Jesus. Does that sound like something that you want? I think it's something we all want, right? And that word knowledge in scripture, I believe both in the Greek and the Hebrew, speaks of a very experiential knowledge, right? I mean, in the Old Testament, like Adam knew Eve, and then little baby, you know, Seth came along. So anyway, <laughs> tough crowd, man. That literally is, so, you know, meaning very experiential, very firsthand, very practical when we know someone, when we know something. God wants us to know him at the depths of our being, at the depths of our spirit. Peter always says everything is about Jesus, right? It's all, that's it. He's the, he's it. He's the hub. He's the goal. He's the objective. He's the, the way, the truth, and the life. It's all about knowing him and just being close to him. Um, but here's the thing, just real quickly, right? When we read this passage, um, all of those leadership roles that, that are gifts to the body, did you catch what they're supposed to be doing? Anybody, you can pop that verse back up there, Michael, if you don't mind. Equipping whom? Equipping who? The people, the body of Christ, yes, for what? Service, and do you know what that word service is? It is the word, the same word as, as we get deacon from, diacono, and it is, I hope I pronounced that right, Mark, or others who actually would know this stuff, but correct me later if I didn't, it's cl somewhat close. It is the work ministry, ministry. Wow, when I say ministry, normally in the 21st century, what do you think of? Or who do you think of? pastors, leaders, right? Oh, that ministry. Oh, that's .org, you know, such and such an evangelistic ministry, such a missions ministry, or maybe the pastor who speaks. But here in the word, we're being told that God is saying, hey, I want my people equipped for works of ministry. So who is, according to the word of God, who are the ministers in this room? All of us, we are. Us is them, they is us. We, all of you, Listening in online, if you love Jesus, if you're a part of his body, you are a minister. Man, may God help us to grab this. So that's where we, equipping becomes that much more important because the process of training and equipping is what enables us, right? Empowers us to step into the things that God has called us to do and to be. Okay, so moving on from this, let me ask you this. Um, what is, and if we have the, yes, we have a microphone. Uh, what do you think is a difference in between teaching and training? What is the difference between teaching and training? Or what is the relationship between the two concepts and the two uh, processes? This is the interactive portion of Shine Church. Welcome. So this is the part where we are not asking rhetorical questions, but we are actually asking you. So I think that teaching is theoretical. It's the idea. It's the information. Okay. And training is practical. It's experiential. 
and it's practice. Mm. It's doing it. Good. Love it. Powerful. Somebody else over here? Jackie. Um, I immediately thought of give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. Wow. Very good. Mm -hmm. There's a multiplicational element and an ability to, yeah, that's great. Somebody else? And then we got one in the sound booth after that. Teaching is like telling somebody how to run. Training is actually running. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> wow! Yes, Michael. Teaching is imparting knowledge, and training is imparting a skill or how to do something. Okay, wow. Good, Michael. Anybody else? Good. You guys agree? Oh, yeah, we got one more? Yeah. Uh, teaching is about the thinking, and training is about the action. Wow, great. Love that. So smart good, group guys. of people here. Woo! Smart group wow. of people. Man, alive. We need some of you guys to come to Saturday just to, you know, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> that's awesome. I love it. So good. So rich, guys. Everything that's shared. And I think we all agree, right? It's not that one is right and one is wrong or one is better and one is not, right? They, they both... I think, would we agree that they can work really well in tandem? Yeah. That, that as our mind is renewed, then that then facilitates us to act or to do, right? Out of the, the overflow of, of how we think, right? So I think such a powerful thing, but they're not exactly the same. And I believe that God is saying, hey, I want to incorporate both in greater measure. And he's saying that, in his words. Uh, a, a couple of thoughts I had is um, I wrote down uh, training is about becoming, not merely knowing. Um, the goal is transformation, not just information, right? And I think we would all agree with that. And again, they're both so important and they can both work hand in hand beautifully uh, in the kingdom of God and to help us become uh, what God is calling us to be. Just that I, th I thought about this. Um, I know a lot about the, Na well, I don't know a lot, but I know some about the Navy SEALs, right? I mean, I've learned about Marcus Luttrell. Anybody? Have you read the book? Or did you see the movie? No, I'm just kidding. You don't have to answer that. Somebody loaned me the book and I just ended up watching the movie and said, but you know, it's all the, he talks about lone survivor, right? This unit of, of Navy SEALs that gets dropped in the hills of Afghanistan and then end up getting, you know, given away by a shepherd boy and, and get shot at for, you know, six hours and all of them die except for one. Sorry, I didn't. Sorry, spoiler, spoiler alert. Whoa, okay. Ooh, sorry about that. Anyway, the point being, I, I know that. I, anybody seen uh, maybe uh, American Sniper? I know all about, all about Chris Kyle and all about, wow, on a rooftop and he's got the little spotter and they're like, all right, click, 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 you know, three clicks. And yeah, I can tell you all about Navy SEALs. I can tell you about six minute miles. I can tell you about working out and growing beards and being manly and all this kind of stuff, right? But would you agree that doesn't make me a Navy SEAL? Would you want me to be the only line of defense between you and <laughs> don't answer that because you know I could be little David you know with my sling but you know yes I think we all agree right there's a big difference between knowing something and truly becoming something being transformed um, why is transformation why is training such a big deal to God and why should it be a big deal to us um, Back in 2005 and then in 2011, my wife and I got to go to Israel with Jubilee Fellowship Church. And it was really just a, an incredible perk uh, that they offered to their staff. They would try to take different members of the staff um, and, and, and try to rotate through the staff as much as possible to give each of us an exposure. And one of the things that I took away from uh, my trip there, there were many things that impacted me. Um, I even, my eyes moistened up once, I think, but you know, it might have been the allergies. Um, but here's the deal. We went to the Western Wall. And at the Western Wall, uh, they have a curtain that's about five uh, feet high or so. And all the ladies are on the right-hand side as you're facing the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall. All the men are on the left. That's just how they do it. And this particular day that we went, there was a bar mitzvah celebration happening, a rite of passage. So a young boy, 13 years old in a day, um, was there with his dad, with his, probably his grandpa, some other men in his life. And he had two big scrolls that were you know, the word of God, right? And at the bar mitzvah ceremony, at this rite of passage is the first time that a young man is entrusted to read the word of God publicly. 
So no doubt he's trained, he's prepared, he's practiced, he's, and this is a big moment, right? Where, uh, and so they're there, and one of the things that a father will often say as part of that ceremony is, God, I thank you that from this day forward, I am no longer responsible for the sins of my son. Think about that. Maybe a glass half empty kind of approach. <laughs> but here's the power in it, that they're saying from this day forward, he's a man. From this day forward, he stands on his own two feet, even before God, the judge. From this day forward, I consider him an equal in terms of his, his relationship with God. And that father is so proud. Sometimes they'll lift up the child on their shoulders and say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That can be part of that bar mitzvah celebration. Here's something interesting. On the other side of that curtain were, you know, probably the mom and the other ladies and all this kind of stuff. And they were like, they were like yelling and, and doing that. And then they were throwing candy. So they were, <laughs> so you've got these men trying to be all serious. You know, like this is, this is God's work over here, you know. <laughs> and the ladies are like, yeah. And as soon as they would look, we pelt them with candy. <laughs> Like, you still have some of the childhood in you, you know. <laughs> you still like chocolate. But anyway, the point being that here's what, what struck me is that that dad is taking his son seriously. That dad believes in his son's ability to become. He's not just saying, look at me as a man. Look at how well I am a husband. Look at how well I am a father. Look at how well I am a man in the community who is respected. But he's saying, I believe that you are called to become what I am. I believe what's in you is capable of growing and transforming and developing into the fullness of one day perhaps being a husband, perhaps being a dad on your own right. When you think of the way God looks at you, is that what you think of? Do you hear his voice saying, I see so much in you. I believe so much that you're capable of. I'm so excited about the gifts that I've put inside of you. I'm so excited about the way that you can reflect me uniquely in a way that DJ never will ever even dream of. In the unique context, in the unique line of work or the unique set of friends or the unique personality that you have or the unique sense of humor you have or the unique way that you engage with people at the gym or in the classroom or wherever with your family around the Thanksgiving dinner table. Do you hear him? His father's heart of prayer. You know, a father is the first to see and believe in his child. Right? I believe that dads often are like, you know, ah, is that a chest hair? You're a man, son. Rah! Is that a little whisker coming out? Ha <laughs> ha, you're growing a beard and you're only seven. Yeah, that's my son. A dad, hopefully, if you didn't have that kind of a dad, Man, I'm sorry, and I realize in this world we don't all have those kinds of dads, but I believe that the Father longs for you to hear that that's the kind of way he sees you, that that's the kind of dad he is, that he's, man, the tiniest little sign of, of gifting, of talent in any area, of, of passion shared for him or with him. Man, he's all over it, just shouting and screaming and cheering you on and calling that out and rejoicing over you. He believes in us. He takes us seriously. I believe that's what the second reason that God is so excited about training is because it reveals his father's heart for us, right? And what is his father's heart? What is his expectation? What does he believe about us? Well, Luke 6, verse 40, Jesus said this, the student is not above the teacher, but listen, but everyone who is fully trained, say fully trained, everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Who said this? And he's the teacher, right? Do you catch the power of that? He's telling us, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I think he's telling us that as we become fully trained, we're gonna look more and more like him as our teacher. Is that, do you get that out of this? Is that, am I, you know, am I trying to twist something? Okay, that's pretty, wow. Is anybody else intimidated by that? <laughs> like, Oh, boy, okay, I don't, you know, I don't always look at myself in the mirror in the morning and be like, yeah, just like Jesus, except for the blue sash, but, you know, yeah. Maybe you feel that way as well, but here's the trick, is that qualifier, right? Fully trained. Would you believe that that word that's used there, fully trained, is the noun version of the verb, excuse me, is the verb version of the noun that appears in Ephesians 4? 
The, the leaders are there to equip God's people for the ministry. Jesus is saying, I want this process of equipping, of training to be alive and at work in you so that, what? So that you can be like me. Jesus' goal, guys, he believes highly. Do you think Jesus believes more highly in us and the possibilities than we do? I think so. I think sometimes, right, as I look at myself, I might be like, eh, I'll just be a fan from the sidelines. Jesus is like, nope, here's your jersey. Get out there. I believe in you. Go, score a touchdown. As my high school coach, basketball coach, told me in Hot Springs, Arkansas, I was like, Smith, take the ball to the hole. Take the ball to the hole. Now, why did he say that? Because I couldn't shoot worth nothing. So he knew if there's any chance I'm going to score even a single point, it was like, get right under the basket. Bank shot. Anyway, Jesus believes in us. He is passionate about this transforming, equipping, training process, being alive, alive in our lives. Um, so what does that mean for us? I believe leaders are responsible to equip based on what the Father sees in us. Would you agree? And I think we're going to give an account. We leaders are going to give an account. And God's not going to ask me one day, well, did you do a great job teaching did you entertain them? Did you make them laugh? Did you make them cry? Did you make them maybe journal something in their journal that afternoon? Wow, what a, what a fantastic teacher DJ is. Nope, I'm not gonna get any credit for that. I think he's gonna ask me, did you help them? Did you equip them? Did you see what I saw in them? Or were you so enamored with your own gifts, DJ, and the sound of your own voice that you felt really great on those Sunday afternoons? That's how I see it. That's how I genuinely see how God is going to judge me. And so our goal as leaders is to go, hey, God, how do you want this process of equipping, training, and raising up so that every one of us can step in to what God has put inside of us, to his calling on our lives? Can I give you a brief history of church gatherings? Because I think this applies to how, what we do on the weekend and how we do it. Anybody want a brief? This is like a 60 second, don't worry. 60 seconds, are you ready? Acts chapter two. They met every day in homes or at the temple. Agreed? You can look that up later, but it's true. Okay, one thing led to another. Fast forward to 1989. Um, my grandpa's church <laughs> in Hot Take. I said it would be brief. It would be an abbreviated church history lesson. 1989, I'm at Central Assembly of God in Hot Springs, Arkansas. My grandpa's church, the birthplace of Assemblies of God Church. Anyway, and we're there. And uh, they met on Sunday morning. Sunday night and, you guessed it, Wednesday night. And the pastor, Pastor Terry Cameron, I love this guy. He was just a young guy, still with, you know, kind of that flair and, and flavor of, of that part of the country and, and kind of that tradition. Terry Cameron is his name. But he would say, you know what? He goes, the people who love church come on Sunday morning. The people who love the pastor come on Sunday night. But the people who love God uh, come on Wednesday what am I saying? Oh, fast forward to 2022. Can I say one service per week, maybe? Is that safe to say? When I'm not snowboarding, camping, bike riding, gardening, watching, you know, whatever. Is that okay? So what am I saying? I know some of you are just so tense right now. Like, dear God, please don't let him say we're adding a Sunday night service. I can't do it. Lord, I can't. I will become a Muslim or a Buddhist, I swear. No, that is not what I want. Do you want another service, Peter? No. Peter does not want another service. <laughs> Kim, do you want another service? Oh, man. Oh, she's, she is more spiritual than most of us. Cammie, do you want another service? <laughs> I should have known better than that, Pastor Kim. She really loves God. Uh, I can, I can count on one hand the number of times I have found myself on a Sunday afternoon going, I hope I get to go back to church tonight. This many. But here's the thing. So I'm not talking about adding more stuff, but would you agree that if we only have, compared to every day in homes and at the temple courts, or compared to 30 years ago, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, if we only have one time maybe a week, does it add that much more urgency? Does it create that much more accountability for us as leaders to say, God, what are we doing with your people, your precious sons and daughters, whom you have filled with gifts and with 
fire and with your Holy Spirit and with a calling from God and with an ability to multiply and make disciples, make other followers of Jesus in this world. It, it's, it's a sobering thought to me. And we take that very seriously, and I know you do too. So this is the huddle. This time, I believe, on weekends is the huddle. This is Dove Valley, not Empower Field. Hopefully, we're going to be more effective than the Broncos have been as of late. But <laughs> game time is when we walk out those doors, All right? I, I read a pastor. Uh, his name is uh, John Mark Comer. He's a pastor in Portland. Really, really love his stuff. And he talks about the idea of the calling of God that is twofold on each one of us. There's two commissions, two great commissions. The first one is found in the book of Genesis where God said, I bless you. Go and subdue the earth and have dominion over it. Bring order to the world. Bring beauty to the world. Bring my creativity into the world. If it's in software, if it's designing websites, if it's training people on how to work out, if it's teaching kids, if it's doing a landscaping business, Make it beautiful. Make this planet shine and sparkle with the beauty of God. That other people might go, wow, that is beautiful. The way that you're doing that accounting and that Excel spreadsheet. Man, I see the glory of God. <laughs> right? Do you believe that? That we can bring the glory of God by being stewards of creation. We need to take some time as Christians to think about that commission. Because as we do that with all of our hearts, like so many, Daniel and Joseph, and look at all of right history in the word of God, the men and women that, that really just heard from God and saw how they can reflect him in creation were often the ones that had a platform to actually tell others about that God that they served. But the, yes, there is a second commission of making disciples of all nations, obviously, as we know from Matthew 28. And so I believe God is saying, hey, I want church to be a time where you're not just being equipped on one of those commissions for an hour and 30 minutes a week, you're being equipped for the other 166 and a half hours of the week. Does that make sense? You're being equipped and empowered so that you know how to go out there when you're on the front line, when you've got the jersey on, when it's game time for you, and you feel like, yeah, what I just experienced on Sunday, that's equipping me now to go forth, and I feel confident, and I feel you know, that the Lord is with me, and I'm learning from my brothers and sisters, and I'm learning from the leaders, and I'm being challenged and encouraged and equipped. Bob Sorge says this. Bob Sorge is a, was a worship leader who um, lost his voice through a surgical mishap, and his whole life was turned upside down. But he writes in his books, it's tremendous the depth of relationship he has with the Lord, but he wrote this. When God wants to teach us something, he puts us in a classroom. When he wants to train us, he puts us on the battlefield. Kind of what Lauren was saying, right? When God wants to teach us, and that's important, he puts us in a classroom. We need to learn stuff, right? It's important. But when he wants to train us, he might move us to the battlefield, let us actually have battle experience. Side note, Judges, the first couple chapters, speaks of God even leaving some enemies in the promised land on purpose, so that the next generation would learn warfare. Can you imagine? He's like, nope, J uh, uh, Joshua, nope, don't mess with those guys. Your kids are going to conquer those guys because I want them to know and be on the battlefield and truly be trained, just like your generation, jo uh, uh, Joshua, marched around Jericho, saw my power, grew in boldness and confidence and faith. I want your kids and their kids to grow that as well. So why does it matter? Another reason is this. I believe that mindset, the mindset of a kingdom is so important to God. Mindset matters. It sets our expectation. Um, would you agree we rarely rise above our expectations? Has that been true in your life? I mean, I ran a marathon um, too many years ago to count, as you can tell. It wasn't last year if you were wondering, but I think it was 2014. I ran a marathon, and when I came up to that 13 mile, and it was that last point one, I didn't find myself, like, I was like, there's the finish line. It was at Town Center, you know, in Highlands Ranch, after running all the way up that last road, you know, for like a mile uphill, and I was literally just leaving it all on the, on the battlefield, so to speak, and I ran, and I didn't find myself going, oh, wow, I'm not that tired. I'm gonna go an extra 13.1 to make it a full marathon. No, that did not even cross my mind. I was exhausted. I literally about crumbled. My legs were, were gelatin. 
And I think I started crying afterwards because I literally just was completely exhausted. But here's the thing. When we set a goal for ourselves or an expectation or a mindset, it's rare that we actually are going to exceed that. What if this? What if the enemy has succeeded in allowing us to set our goals here where we, this is almost impossible for us to grow to this place in the Lord? Or what if this? Have you ever felt even guilty desiring something higher? Have you ever felt like, I'm not equipped for that? God hasn't told me I'm a pastor or a leader. I can't have a voice in that way. God's not going to use my words. I'll probably mess it up. I'll probably say something totally out of context and totally wrong. That's going to cause somebody to lose their faith and become an atheist. (laughs) The enemy is an expert at convincing us and setting our mindset in a way completely opposite of what God is saying. Here's how I see you. Here's what I, the possibilities I see in you and where I want to equip and train you to become. Somebody said this, God is counting boots on the streets more than bottoms in the seats. And I think that's something we can all get around, right? I don't think he's counting, oh, wow, look at Shine Church. They've got 76 people sitting there. Oh, that brings me such glory. No, I think he's saying, hey, I'm looking at 76 people that are boots on the streets, that are making disciples, that are praying for their kids, that are loving their families, that are however it is that you're getting to know Jesus more and walking with him. He loves that. He sees you out there as boots on the streets. He's proud of you as you as you choose to just engage with him each and every day. Now, years ago, I was um, part of a Tangsudo class. And a Tangsudo is the military version of Taekwondo, which is a, um, a martial art form. And uh, this lady named Karen Eden, who was a, um, uh, a, a meteorologist, would donate her time on Saturday afternoons and help all of us inner city people at the time uh, learn this skill. And, uh, and so I went there, and I was a white belt. I made it eventually to, to orange belt, which is only two belts up. Anyway, and, uh, but she would come in and sometimes demonstrate uh, the forms. And man, I wish I had some way to illustrate for you, because it was so inspiring. Is there anybody in here that like knows? Oh, Tracy, don't you practice martial arts? Yeah, wow. How, what a coincidence that you're right here. At the right time, right when I need you, would you come and just demonstrate for us kind of like how a martial art form might look by a pro? Give it up for Tracy Lights, guys. By the way, real quick, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, dear Tracy, happy birthday to you. I didn't tell you I was going to do that. Give it up for Tracy Lights. Okay, maestro, cue the music. bit more of my karate kid music to be inspired thank you so much tracy one more hand for tracy you are excused it's your birthday go out and have fun with your family so here's the deal thank you so much here's the deal so karen would do things like that right and and just all intense and would be demonstrating these skills and it was like oh wow so like all of us white belts and yellow belts like, oh, oh. slow down professor what was that? Oh, yeah. Sap, sap, sap. I'm not going to do it because I'll pull a muscle and we'll all be embarrassed. But the point being this, it can be inspiring. It can show us what's possible. Have you ever felt inspired like that? Do you want to be inspired? I want to be inspired. I love it when I see someone walk in a gifting and it's just like, oh, man, they're amazing at that. I love that. I believe God wants us to be inspired. I believe he wants us to be, you know, just, just that spark inside of us. Let me ask you this. Do you think sometimes demonstration by the pros at that level. She's a third degree black belt. Do you think sometimes demonstration like that, if that is all that I experienced, could that ever become discouraging? Could that ever become overwhelming? Could that ever become something that actually hinders my progress? Because it's just like, oh, wow. Sensei. (laughs) Keep eye contact. 
I think that there's a, there's a balance, right? God wants us to be inspired. He wants excellence demonstrated. But here's what would happen in that little tongue pseudo class is that we would also at times, uh, Karen would say, okay, now I'm gonna have the orange belts turn around and it was like black belts, red belts, green belts, orange, yellow, and white was all the way at the back where yours truly was. But sometimes you'd say, okay, now turn around. Orange belts, you're gonna teach the yellow and the white belts forms two and three. Green belts, you're gonna teach the orange belts. Black belts, you're gonna teach the red belts. And so there would just be this interactive moment where we were all learning from one another based on what skills we could teach one another. And those were the times, if I'm perfectly honest with you, where I actually was able to then put into practice my forms right where I was at, right at the skill level I was at. I appreciated the inspiration she provided, but sometimes it was just somebody come alongside of me and just helping me get from, from white to white and a half. <laughs> right? I believe God is speaking to us saying, hey, I'm more passionate about my people growing and being equipped and being trained than I am about DJ showing off his stuff and, and really, you know, putting on the, the Ritz. I hope you sense that passion. He's trying to change us from a, a church-centered mindset where it's all about what happens in this room and what the leaders do to a kingdom mindset where all of us are out there reflecting Jesus, glorifying Jesus, attracting others to Jesus just by the joy and the love and the giftings that are in us. You know, training's not just a one-way street. Colossians 3.16 talks about we can admonish one another, right, and teach one another. We're called to do that in the body of Christ. So, with that in mind, by the way, on the U version, there's a little bonus category. I'm not gonna talk about it right now because we're gonna jump into some interaction. And it's all about abolishing the faulty, centuries-old notion of the separation be between clergy and laity. Go on you version, read all about it, extra, extra. It talks about the idea that clergy refers to an inheritance that we all have received from the Lord. That's what that word means. And laity, the way it's used nowadays of a division, actually wasn't even used until some dude in 95 AD, wasn't even a scriptural thing, wasn't in the New Testament, and then in the, in the third and fourth centuries, they begin to, to talk about, well, it's for the untrained, the non-professionals. The, one of the words used is even the same word for idiot, is the people that like, they don't know. The, 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 the priests are the ones that are qualified to speak the words of God. All the rest of the people are down here. Read all about that. It's, a, I believe, a demonic separation that was never intended in the heart of God and certainly is not found in Scripture. So, Interactive time. Um, wanted to ask three questions, and you can answer any of the three. Is everybody okay, by the way? Are you okay? Do I seem angry? No? Do I seem, you know, I, I don't want to come across like, um, I don't know, I feel like I'm feeling intense, and I don't want, I, I hope, I'm super joyful about just what I see before me in you, and just what God is already drawing out. And I just believe that he's just going to increase that. I'm just so excited because just, by, that orange, by that, oh, yeah, it's my, you saw that. You saw it. Could we all agree it would be much more deadly to meet Tracy in a back alley than me? I mean, I think we all, okay. <laughs> She's awesome. So here's the questions. Number one, you can answer any of these you want in no particular order. What fruit have you seen? from our interactive times, right? We've already put into practice some of this, passing the mic around, sharing different things, scriptures, thoughts. So what fruit have you seen? What have you liked? What have you been blessed with in that? Or you can answer what makes you uneasy about the interactive times. I think it's safe to say that when we do kind of different things, it might not always be whatever. It's something that we've all experienced all of our lives. There might be some discomfort. There might be some, you know, maybe sheer terror. Feel free to answer that, what makes you uneasy. Um, and we will love you. Don't, th you're not gonna be judged. You're not gonna be, just, we're a family. So we can share openly with each other. Last, what can we as leaders do to help empower and facilitate this kind of equipping mindset, this kind of training mindset where there's opportunities, as we said, in these precious times we have together, which are once a week, if that, what can we be doing to help equip you, to help do this better, to help guide from pitfalls? 
Um, so what do you love? What makes you uneasy? What can we be doing better? Obviously, if you have technology types ideas or, or what can we, tools that could be used, love to hear that as well. So who wants to be first? Welcome to the interactive time.com. Okay. Right up here. So uh, this is the best part is the part that makes me uneasy is I have never, ever once nailed the answer. <laughs> I am always wrong. You just did. What are you talking about? That so, was the right answer. But see, but again, I was wrong because I said it was. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm encouraged by it because I feel like it's really a chance. I hear other people kind of going out um, out of their comfort zone to share. And I think as we learn to share in a very, very, very safe environment, it hopefully makes it easier s for us to share at work, to share with our neighbors, right? We've, we're, we're in that training. I, I absolutely see this open, the open mic night. Yeah. Um, as as part of that training and part of the equipping. So I'm really encouraged by that. Even though I say the wrong things all the time. <laughs> I love I'm that. Cool that too. Powerful insight. That even if this is a safe place where we love and trust one another, we can say the wrong thing or, or a thing that we're like, oh wow, after hearing so and so, maybe that but it's safe and we can grow and learn. It gives us confidence for outside these walls. I love that. Um, just to piggyback off of that, I'm an extreme introvert, but I want to be more outgoing. I crave that. I think it's people that are extroverts seem to have more fun. And so <laughs> I, tr I, I, I long to have that, that um, quality, but it's, it's hard for an introvert to do that. Um, Pastor Dan challenged us several weeks ago. He said, if you can't speak in front of your family, then it's t hard to speak in church with your, you know, it, and we call ourselves a family. So none of us have any problem saying anything with our families around the dinner table because that's comfortable. But so that's helped me to grab this mic more because I do consider us a family. And so what I have to say might help someone else. So love that. So love that. And so thankful that you do feel that, Heather. You absolutely are an amazing part of this family. I think Andrew had one, actually, while we're waiting. Oh, <coughs> uh, yeah, a couple things. Uh, I would say, like, the church service that I have felt the most connected to, you know, just everyone, was a couple months ago when Janelle spoke on the Word. And everyone shared their individual scriptures and how God spoke to them through that. That, like, holy cow, that carried <laughs> me for weeks. Like, that was awesome. Um so I would say I definitely love when there's an opportunity f to hear from each and every one of you in this room about real genuine faith that God has given you. And um, it's inspirational. It's encouraging. And um, yeah, just help, help me really connect with God next couple weeks. And then the other thing I'll say is uh, I love this idea of training and equipping and getting to step out and practice. Um, and the leadership, like, at Shine, your job is to help us build that confidence like you just kind of connected um, in here first and then out there. So I don't know what this is going to look like, but I'm excited that you guys are stepping into it, and I'm proud of you. <laughs> um, and I want to see, yeah, I'm excited to see what happens. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was, did anybody else remember that weekend where Pastor Janelle shared? I mean, there was such a, I remember there was one particular person that shared about, you know, being born to a, to a couple out of wedlock and just how that had weighed on him. And I believe it was Psalm 139, just about God being in the midst of, of him being knit together in his mother's womb. It was so trusting and vulnerable and all, I feel like everybody who heard that as I just was like on holy ground, right? Because there's just something that we can't, I don't care how good of a speaker I am, I can't replicate when the Holy Spirit is just doing his work of art and just weaving and, and conducting the orchestra through all of us. Love that. Thank you, Andrew. Well, one thing that kind of everybody was bringing up um, 
reminded me that, you know, God, I mean, we don't come out of the womb walking. We have to crawl before we can walk and, and just have an opportunity to speak sometimes. Like they were saying is that you um, do it in a safe place and with people around you that can pick you up and hold you up and help you and encourage you and say, oh, look, they took a step and oh, down they go back up again. So, so good, so good. So I'll say what I love about the group share time. Um, but growing up in the church, I feel like maybe the subconscious message that I received is that the people on stage were good enough and qualified and that I was in some way less qualified and less trustworthy than those people. Um, because we come and we listen to what you say and, um, you know, and we don't say anything ever. So, um, so I think what I love about the time is that, um, and I think I said this to Dan last week, that you guys trust the Holy Spirit in the body, that like our Holy Spirit isn't broken and it's like not just yours that works. <laughs> and <laughs> if that makes sense, but I, I feel like in the body, we're so quick to disqualify each other. And even if we're not disqualifying each other, like we're disqualifying ourselves and um and the father is so so like he loves the giftings that he's placed in the body and and i love seeing um the diversity of how the lord speaks to different people and how different people pull out different truths and different values from from the same scripture um because it reflects like the lord says all of those things the holy spirit is quickening all of those things um but you, like as one person on stage, don't get all of that. Um, it's the body together that receives like the beauty of who Christ is. Like we have to, it has to be kind of all of those voices for us to really see him clearly or more clearly. And so I love that. I love that I get to see the Holy Spirit in each of these people and I'm really encouraged by it. I mean, I really, I look at the world and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, a this is a big mess. And then I get to see the Holy Spirit speaking to each one of you guys. And I'm like, this is beautiful. It's okay. Like, there's a lot of people who love the Lord and the Holy Spirit is at work. And I'm excited about what the Lord is doing. And so that's all. I just wanted to talk about my buddy Moses and training and what this, we're talking about how can we train. And what she said a minute ago, it, it doesn't happen in an instant. We don't walk, come out of the womb walking. I think of Moses, here he is a baby. God knew the potential in him when he's floating down the river in a, as a baby in a basket. And he's trained into the echelon of Egypt to be a leader, and we all know how that worked. He ends up killing someone, and he runs to the desert, and he's trained again, but this time he's trained by God. And it took him 40 years, and God's instructing him and training him. And he comes out, and he says, God, I can't do this. I can't do this. And God knew his potential, and he says, give me my brother, Aaron. Three chapters later, Moses didn't need Aaron. It starts as little children when we take our kids to Sunday school as babies through the nursery into Sunday school. It goes then into junior high and high school and the middle group that you're talking about, the people that are 18 to 30. It's a lifetime of training. It's not a, I'm equipped after two days or a year. And this church is providing that training in all the things that we do at different age levels. That's training, and that's equipping. Um, I have inherited my mom's great trait of being an introvert. <laughs> it's okay. Um, and 
so in it, not only was it encouraging to see my mom speak up because I she's a genius in my eyes she's a complete genius so seeing her speak and knowing how much work she puts into her relationship with God she's always in the Bible and you can I mean she walks into a room and you just feel like just the peace of God just and it just like washes over me and it's so great um and so then it it, it inspired me to speak too and then I realized that after I started speaking the it's for I kind of thought of it it was um, like a muscle you have to work out the muscle that you want to use and I was able to hear from God easier I was able to trust what he was saying to me more and it was then easier for me to keep the voice inside my head saying oh you can't do it whatever you're thinking whatever you think that you should say you shouldn't say it and it, then it was easier for me to keep that voice quiet and raise my hand be like I'm going to say it even though I'm shaking right now I'm going to say it and now it's it's still there <laughs> it's still there but it's it, I'm not shaking as much anymore and it started from one person picking up the mic and that can be not just my mom it can be anyone and it's just so encouraging to be surrounded by those same people you know so powerful. And what a great example of like, you know, maybe she was your orange belt or your red belt, you know what I mean, teaching you and training. What you saw in her gave you confidence and has given you. And the more that you've kind of stepped out into that, right, you still kind of feel that, but like a little, a little easier each time. Maybe just a hair, right? I love that. That's total growth and equipping and training happening in your life. It's, it's alive in you, Elena. Good job. Other thoughts? So yeah. What's working, what, what isn't, if, if someone wants to share uh, what makes you uneasy. If, if, we, or, if we press more into this, mm -hmm. what are some pitfalls that you guys think we might run into? Okay, so I've been in group therapy before, and I, I love this church, and from day one, I've always felt like it was home. I told Dan that the first time I came here. We are from Dallas. Go Cowboys. <laughs> 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 um, we've only been here two years, but it's just it's just drawn me in, and it's felt like home. Um, I love everyone here, but I love everyone's story, and I've heard it on the Sundays I come and online. I love hearing people's names and getting to know each other. So I'm asking Ben, what's his name? What's his name? <laughs> So that would be my only change, and I love it. I love being able to open up. I usually don't introvert as well, but. <laughs> so you're saying if somebody said their name real quick before they. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Perfect. I love All that. Right. Could we also say, like, what city we're from, like, on a Zoom call? You know, this is DJ from <laughs> Castle Rock. I mean, granted, we'd all probably say from Castle Rock at least. <laughs> my name's Todd. I'm from Denver. Uh, Extra credit for immediate application of the training. <laughs> I, I uh, appreciate what about this is that it, it is uh, bridging a gap um, that was God never intended to be there. Um, the what you were talking about the difference between say the clergy and the lay people, so to speak, but that we are all um, priests. We're a royal priesthood. Um, is bridging that gap and also. Um, just with the, uh, it knits our hearts together. Um, when I listen to other people talk, I have a greater affection for them. When I think thoughts about them just based on what I see, it's just based on what I see, right? And But when I listen to people talk, I have a greater affection for them. And I've just, um, I think it knits our hearts together as a community. Um, and then two, it gives us a platform and I think what we've said repeatedly here is that it trains us in speaking about the things of the Lord. Um, and so we're being trained here just in this moment, like we're all right now being trained, um, watching each other experiment in this, you know, this thing and, and, and learning and growing from each other. So. What's up? My name's Peter. I <laughs> love that, by the way. I do love that. Because as a family, like, we should be able to know each other. Um, okay, so I honestly, what's funny about this to me is that, like, I've gotten up on stage here and even taught. 
And there's something that's more nerve wracking, I swear, about doing this, like than raising your hand. Like it's weird. Like even for me, like my heart starts racing. So like, and I'm an extrovert. So like, <laughs> there's like, I can't imagine how hard it is for some of you guys because it's hard for me. Um, but I guess because the question was, what are some of like the down pitfalls or different things like that? I do think even with this discussion and what we've been talking about today with the training, I love the idea of it trickling down from orange belt to so on and so. I'm not, I don't even know the belt line order except for a black belt, like is the top. That's all I know. And white is lowest. That's it. Um, but honestly, I think what we've done here, and I think lo- what you guys have said a lot of is that it doesn't have to be this order of like, oh, well, actually I'm an orange belt, so I can't learn from you. Like, we have learned so much from, like, DJ has, I can, t- I can even speak for him, like, he's learned from people that literally we would call them crawlers or babies or white belts. Like, we aren't, like, I love this idea and concept that, like, you don't have to come here and feel this, um, like, oh, well, I'm not worthy, or an, I'm, like, you even mentioned, like, I shouldn't speak up right now because I'm not at that level. Like, I have learned more from the simplicity, even like the idea of like, w- as we have to go be- to Jesus as children, like children aren't theologians and apologetics and apologetists and like, like we have to understand that. And so like the one pitfall, even today's conversation, and again, I feel like I'm pushing a little bit back on it, is that I think that we could so easily get discouraged in even what we said. And so that's one reason I wanted to speak up is be like, I don't care if you're a baby or if you just learned who Jesus is, you have something to bring to this family and don't feel hesitant to say, okay, I j- literally just heard the name of Jesus for the first time and the love that I feel might be more than any of us have ever experienced. So just that encouragement. Uh, oh, wh- wow, wow. I was muted. I'm sorry. I thought I, sorry. Um, okay, yes, one more. Well, one more, but the uh, thing I like about this is it shows that we're, instead of just observing, we're participants. Mm-hmm. You know, and as we share, it sh- kind of shows that we're actually listening and paying attention, and if we say something, it actually could help somebody understand what you guys are saying in a better way. That's so good. Thank you, Andy. You know, so here, um, and I love, thank you so much, guys, for, for being a part of this conversation. We're not done with this conversation. So this is an ongoing, this is an ongoing one, right? We, we want, uh, together as a family, we're going to help discover how to do this well. And you're going to be a part of that. Your voice, your idea, your perception, your caution flag, whatever it might be that you bring to this whole thing that God, I believe, is calling us to, to take another step into you're a part of not just receiving that, but like defining that. Does that make sense? You're a part of helping shape that. Um, so just real quick, because it is 1133. I want to respect your time. Here's one way, and again, you know that everything we've done is kind of an experiment, right? We've said that, I think, from the beginning. We're, we're not married to any of the forms that we use. I think I speak for all of us when I say we're married to the outcome of becoming like Jesus, right? Can we all agree, like, we want to become like Jesus. We want to know Jesus, We want to be closer to him. All of these things of how and what we use for a series or for a six-month period or for a year or for a week, I think we're all kind of like probably holding those more lightly. Like, Lord, show us, right? We might try some things. They might not work as well. We might tweak them. We might throw them out. Then other things might work great. So we appreciate just that sense that you guys have of like, hey, as long as there's a good chance it could be effective and draw us closer to Jesus, then... Maybe let's try it, right? And so thank you for, for that. And so I think that's kind of what we're saying. We're not saying we're going to turn everything upside down and that next week when you come, you know, whatever, right? Like, don't, don't be afraid of, oh, no. Oh, what? But I think we are thinking of, of taking kind of this, this idea that we all have the Holy Spirit, that we all hear from the Lord, and just how do we take maybe one more step, right, in terms of that. One of the things that we'd like to try is we like to get out. I know last night somebody mentioned, particularly for the introverts, who've been mentioned a couple times, we love you, introverts. Um, sometimes it's hard to just hear something 
and be asked to respond in the moment. Like, you know, maybe I was, I know you guys never argue with your spouse on the way to church or anything like that, but, you know, um, and we haven't ever either. <laughs> Just mess. But you know, who knows? Maybe we're coming from work, maybe we're coming from this, that. You know, we all come different frames of mind. Different, and if I'm just hearing a verse or a concept for the first time, it might be difficult to just sort of like, some of us are just external processors, others, I'm going to sit and soak in this for an hour or two. Then probably I would actually speak more intelligently. We like to get out the, the scripture or the topic of the following week to you early so that you'd have an opportunity to actually read it, meditate on it. We actually have talked about, uh, Peter's mentioned and others of you, like the Bible Project. There's an app you can download of the Bible Project. Literally just came out like two or three weeks ago. Perfect timing. Where they have videos on different books of the Bible, different context and themes. And you can kind of research a little bit. You know, five, six, seven minute videos, no big deal. All that to say, here's what we're thinking is maybe what if we got you some of that stuff a little earlier so that it would give you an opportunity to just kind of in whatever way you want you can still just come. You're like, nope, didn't read any of it. Didn't listen. You're still welcome <laughs> to come. Absolutely, 100%. But if you want to like dig in a little bit here or there, then that might give you that added confidence, right? To be like, oh my goodness, I think I'm going to share this piece in the conversation. Does that sound like maybe a good step? So, but please let us know as we go. Email us, comment on the weekend, whatever, what's falling down, what isn't working, what we can do better. We're not trying to be like, oh, good luck with everything. Have fun storming the castle. You know, we're, we're as pastors and leaders, we're very much wanting to be present and helping at every step of the way. So we're not trying to like, you know, does that make sense? We're not trying to like, good luck with that. But we're very much, how do we together and how do, what role do we maybe uniquely play in helping you grow um, and all that. So uh, putting that into practice for next weekend, here is the verse that we are going to be looking at, or the passage that we're going to be looking at. It's in Ephesians chapter 4, if you can pull that up, Michael. And uh, we're going to read the first five verses. It says this, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Again, he's not talking to pastors. He's talking to the body of Christ. Each of us have received a calling. Uh, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So what a powerful passage. I believe that one of the first things we can do that God wants us to be equipped and trained in is what are the attitudes and the heart postures that we can have, as Peter, Peter mentioned, hey, I might be pushing back a little bit on this, or do you know what I'm saying? If, if one, somebody shares one thing, and maybe you sense a little bit of like a, a balancing perspective, if that makes sense, or a little bit of that tension of the, of the tent that we talked about last week, um, how do we do that graciously as he did in love, in humility, that, that the other people all around us feel encouraged and uplifted? This passage, I think, speaks to that and gives us some secrets. So I know specifically in verse 2, there's three or four specific qualities that are mentioned there. Maybe look into those. Uh, meditate on this if, if the Lord leads you to do that. Come back ready to share next weekend. Anything else that we need to say? Good? You guys good? Okay. Well, God bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. I forget the rest of it. It's all good. God bless you. Have a great weekend. Vaya con Dios.